Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Ratner, and today I am joined by Fran Summer Anderson. She is a licensed psychologist in New York, a psychoanalyst from the NYU postdoctoral program, and a somatic experiencing practitioner. She is uh, very well known in the field, wrote a book with Eric Sherman, and worked with Dr. Sarno under Arlene Feinblatt, so lots to learn from her. Can't wait to talk to her. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and I'll get back to you personally. Fran, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, I've been wanting to have you on for some time because I really like to bring on kind of what I consider the biggest names in in the mind-body field, and you are one of those to me for sure. Uh, we met back in 2014 um, at one of the trainings that you and Eric did, so it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking with you. So when how I usually start these things, because I, I want to I learn about who you are in this work and highlight you because I, there's so many great minds in the mind body field yours being one of them i want to learn about that so can you talk about your experience with mind body symptoms because that's usually the lead in for people when did yours start how did how did it go my symptoms started in the fall of 1983 84 i had done my clinical psychology internship at Rusk Institute. And I was fortunate to be able to stay on as part of the clinical psychology department. And in 1979, thanks to Dr. Arlene Feinblatt, the psychologist who helped Dr. Sarno develop his theories and refine them, um, she invited me to work on the pain service with her. And I worked with Dr. Sarno's patients under her supervision. And in those days, we all the patients met with Dr. Sarno regularly and the providers, uh, the clinicians met with him also. And it was a, just one of the life changing times in my life. I was so grateful. And so I started in 1979 working with Dr. Sarno's patients and it went was a dream come true because I had been fascinated with the mind-body problem since my first psychology course in college. And I was learning so much and getting, studying, reading. And I started to have what first seemed like sinus headaches. I'd never had headaches before except one in high school, which was definitely related to an emotional event. But I had never had headaches, and and they increased in frequency. And I didn't believe that there was any physical cause, but after they continued for um, a year or so, I did have them checked by a neurologist just to rule out any structural or organic processes going on, and there was nothing wrong. And I was told, well, you have a combination migraine and tension headache syndrome. And I was in analysis and I was working hard on myself. I was working hard with my patients. And uh, I was trying to figure out why am I having these headaches? And it was also embarrassing to me because I was having success with my patients, but I was having headaches. And it was, it was many years before I actually sort of came out and disclosed that I had had headaches for so long because I was embarrassed. And I think it's so important that uh, we as practitioners with one another acknowledge that we have had symptoms. We, we might still be having symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to work on ourselves as well. And patients, I know, appreciate that greatly. But I had to be up to, to telling the world, the clinical world, that I had had headaches. And it took me 20 years to resolve my headaches. Wow. And so that was very humbling and it's helped me have a lot of empathy for my clients. And what it took for me was to recognize that my early life experience had had a tremendous impact on my autonomic nervous system in terms of keeping me in a state of 
high sympathetic activation and the chronic sympathetic activation despite doing breathing practices and getting body work in addition to my work in analysis, my personal analysis. And I was fine when I, when I was finally clear that my analyst was not going to save me, that I had to do something. I had to be much more active in taking care of myself that I started to get better. And within, within a few months, just from doing taking time for myself every day to do a, a simple breathing practice that started to uh, balance my sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system so that I was no longer going around in a state of uh, chronic sympathetic activation. And it was amazing. And even though I, I was treating people who got better, it was amazing to me. So I'm very humbled by the power of the mind-body experience. And I've gotten particularly interested in the last five years or so in the research on the impact of early life adversity on our uh, mental and uh, physical health later in life. Wow, there, there's so much I want to respond to in that because you 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 really captured so many aspects. But I want to say one thing, and this relates to my work. We talked a little bit about this before the interview. Um, in my language, we we talked about how everybody kind of forms a different language of how we we talk about this. So I have my three columns, and what I heard you saying fits with an idea that I have called the power column, where you realized. It's not going to be somebody else that saves me from this. I'm going to need to do something. And and to me, in my language, mm -hmm. you t you took on the role of power there. Right. And it and it fits with what I know because the people who tend to have a a longer time, uh, a, a kind of harder battle, usually do need that that power column element. That's the thing that's that's holding them back. So mm -hmm. many great things you said. I was struck also by the fact that you and I were both very interested in mind-body issues before we even discovered Sarno or even had symptoms. Absolutely. So it's kind of like at some level we we know we know who we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things I want to highlight in that, but we'll circle back to some of them. I want to talk a little bit, though, about how you got connected to Arlene Feinblatt and Sarno, and we're going to have Arlene on actually soon. So okay. I'm going to get to talk to her too. Um, and Eric's come on. So, we, you know, I'm getting to talk to the whole gang. <laughs> but I wondered if you could talk about how, how you first got exposed to Sarno and the idea of kind of this iteration of mind-body ideology. I was working at, at Rusk and uh, the first five years after my internship, I was working with, people with uh, neuromuscular disease, commonly known as muscular dystrophy. And I did some research on sexuality and muscular dystrophy. And that was published. And I was learning so much about how to work with people who are having progressive decline in their physical health. Uh, but it was, it was very taxing. And I started to feel burned out. Mm -hmm. And I, I had become friends with Arlene. Uh, by that time, and she invited me to uh, start seeing pain patients. As, so I split my time between muscular dystrophy clients and people in pain, and that's that's how I got started. Mm -hmm. And um, what was what was it like working with Sarno? I, I fascinated by that. Oh, idea. It was well. And um, at first, he was a little scary because he was what I call an authoritative person. Mm -hmm. But he also had a wonderful sense of humor. And he could just sort of say something very funny in the middle of a, a, a staff meeting and just you know, show the, the human side, that he's very human, very funny. He loved life. He loved to play. He loved to sing. And, you know, that sort of 
brought in um, the, his humanity. And he would all, he also talked about having his own symptoms. And he was very compassionate about his patients and just spent so much time giving to them, taking phone calls from them regularly, um, doing the lectures after work, um, going to group meetings, supporting them. So he was committed to his patients at a level that uh, is not, I haven't seen very often. And that was so impressive. Yeah, I mean, he's so impressive in so many ways, but I want to, I don't want to get too sidetracked on him because I want to focus on you, but the, I just, well, I had to hear a little bit what, what your personal experience was like with him. So, um, as you were working with patients, but not yet better, did you find that your practice changed in any particular way when you did get better or, or your level of confidence in it? What was that like? Um, my practice changed when I took the Peter Levine somatic experiencing training. Mm -hmm. And it was during it get, because that training gave me some new tools to incorporate in helping my clients in pain. And also it was during that period where I was having my own somatic experiencing sessions with a practitioner that was part of the requirement that it was during that period that I was able to access my earliest traumatic experiences, the pre-verbal ones. And that I know changed me and in the way I was in the room with them. Right. Uh, I always had confidence in the, mind body connection and I could see that it's it was very powerful. I'm sure that I changed in ways that I'm not aware of, but I, I know that I was aware of being different um, once I started somatic experiencing training. And when when was that uh, in the I time started, frame of things? I started it in 2009 and it uh, it took me 3 years you can do it faster. And um when did you write Pathways to Pain Relief? That's the book that um, you wrote with Eric Sherman, of course, um, which I found to be fascinating and really important, especially for practitioners, to think about how are we working with people. When do um, Eric and I were working on that book. We got the idea around 2009, and we wanted to, in some way, present our experience in a way that would be useful to people in pain, as well as be respected by a professional audience. Mm -hmm. um, so we began working on the book and then various projects and life events came along and uh, it took us until 2000, January 2013 to actually get it um, in, into print or onto Amazon, so to speak, in our, right. we self-published. And then we uh, then eventually translated it into Spanish. And that was also self-published by Amazon last year. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I had Eric on right when that had just happened, uh, mm -hmm. or shortly after it had just happened. Uh-huh. So I do want to hear more about the book, but I'm, I'm thinking about this... Uh, this kind of transition moment you had with somatic experiencing. And you had mentioned that you were in analysis, but you realized that your analyst wasn't going to save you. You had to do it yourself. Was that around the time you discovered somatic experiencing? Was that part of the event that led to that change? I, I'm not presuming anything, but I'm just wondering. Realizing that I had to participate in saving myself um, came in the early 90s. Okay. When I was in, I had started analytic training in 1989. And um, in 1988, the birth of the relational psychoanalytic orientation sure. took place. And I had thought that I was a Freudian, but I discovered that I wasn't. And yep. the relational approach, which merely talks about the influence that the patient and the analyst have on one another 
regardless. I mean, there's no way to avoid it and looks at it in a way that's very open and, and uh, muted, a way that's different from a classical Freudian approach. Yeah. And it also, the relational orientation also allows for modifications of technique and for the therapist to be creative in you know, bringing in a breathing practice, for example, and uh, using imagination in a, in a more active way. Um, so that was, that was wonderful for me. And I began to feel, okay, I'm, you know, I'm ready to, ready to do this. Yeah, and it's more of a it's more of a two way experience, of course, and more a more collaborative model. So, okay, so there was a big shift in in the '90s where you and and that was when your symptoms got, you know. Well, I was reduced. having symptoms as early as '83, '84. Yeah, well, when I think about it, I was having symptoms as early as pre-verbal. You know, I I can't remember, but I know I was. <laughs> I'm sure that I was having something pre-verbally. I know I was. All right. So tell us about tell us about somatic experiencing. It's something that I I get asked about sometimes. I haven't done the training in it. I feel like I kind of get it just at a basic level, but tell me what that's been like for you and how you think about that work. Sure, I think you would really enjoy it. Um, it somatic experiencing is a teaching approach developed by Peter Levine, who is uh, a pioneer in treating trauma. And in some ways he reminds me of Dr. Sarno. He's kind of a lone wolf studying trauma in animals first, and then studying trauma in people. And his focus is always on how can we help the, the person who's had a trauma and they're stuck in the traumatic moment or traumatic hours, they're stuck in the experience in their mind and in their body, even though they may go, be going along and functioning very well. Um, but they're stuck in their in the traumatic ex moment. And he, based on he was also a um, body worker, a rolfer. So he brought his knowledge of the body from that perspective together with his study of trauma and animals and learning how the human nervous system recovers from trauma and brings together an, a model that is very focused on helping the person recover a sense of agency. And when you talk about power, it's helping the person feel that, learn how they can have power over their lives. Wow. That's an oversimplification, but it really is based on that. Yeah. Okay. It's about trauma is an overwhelming emotional experience. Sometimes it's an overwhelming physical experience if it's physical abuse, but an overwhelming experience that in which the person feels that they have no agency. They, the only, perhaps the only thing they can do is just be quiet mm. or dissociate. They, you know, go up on the ceiling somewhere and look down. Right. Yeah, that's so powerful. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what does the work actually look like when you're doing somatic experiencing work? How is it different, uh, if at all? I don't know. Maybe it's just more of a, a way of thinking about things. My sense is there's some differences, though. Um, it's, it's different in that from the moment you have an interaction with a client, um, you are looking and listening to the patient's body as well as to what they say. Now, analysts do that too, but people trained in somatic experiencing, I think um, they're more finely tuned. Mm -hmm. And you are um, ideally in the beginning of the, the first session from the time you meet them, you are... Uh, working to help them feel safe in a new environment, if it's on Zoom or in your office, um, you uh, can be quite active. And I learned how, how to be very active 
um, like just introducing, you know, you're in a new place, you're in a new environment with me, you're with a new person, take your time, look around, how do you feel being in this office? What's happening in your body? As you look around, what's happening in your body? As you just experience being with me, any and every reaction is, is okay. And we're just interested in knowing how your whole system is responding in a new environment because a new environment, um, it's bound to create some sympathetic activation. And if a traumatized person who is also in uh, pain comes into your office, they're going to have an extra jolt of activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So that's where you begin. And you invite them to participate in the, in the encounter, uh, pay attention to all of their reactions. And then if someone is um, in a high, highly anxious state about their pain, let's say, um, and I wrote about this in the John Bowlby lecture that I gave, which is now published. Um, I wrote about my uh, work with Martin, who was so anxious when he came to his first session. He was anxious about the pain in his feet um, that he asked to bring his wife with him um, to help him feel safer. So our first session was all about helping the two of them feel comfortable in my office, teaching him some simple breathing and awareness practices that I had learned in somatic experiences, experiencing to help him calm down and feel settled enough that he could then use his higher brain consciousness to think and give me the story of what had happened. And I go into uh, considerable detail about how I did that um, in, in the article that I wrote. But basically, um, if you and I were doing it here now, I would, you know, in addition to teaching you about coherent breathing, uh, which is a simple breathing practice that you can find on the coherentbreathing.com website. Um, it just teaches you to balance sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And then I would in, invite you to notice that you can have the experience of receiving the support of your seat, the floor under your feet, and then the orienting response, which is to just gradually let your eyes take you around the room in both directions, just noticing what your eyes are drawn to look at if they're drawn to linger at something and even just this simple orienting response can help people go and feel a little safer so i made a little acronym called ego um, tools that you can use anywhere and nobody mostly nobody will notice the first the e is for do an extended exhalation the exhalation activates the parasympathetic calming Part of the autonomic nervous system and then grounding is just being aware of your body being supported and uh, with the orienting response and if you um if you love animals you know that the animals do the orienting response you know like okay what, what's going on is this everything okay am i do i feel safe yeah, and it's it's so. First of all, I want to I want to express some appreciation for the kind of work that you do, and for people like you, who help people understand those subtleties in themselves. Because so much of the world, I mean, the vast majority of everything, skips right over all that stuff. Doesn't even think about it. So we're people like you and I help people be much more attuned to what's happening. But one thing I'm struck by is in what you're saying, and this is how I thought of somatic experiencing, is that it is um, it is kind of learning the language of the body. Mm -hmm. And the body is always saying these very subtle and small things. And if we pay attention to them, we can learn a lot of stuff. And it made me want to ask you a question about oh, the way that I think about certain things. 
I'd just be curious to come, kind of compare notes about this. Sarno talked about um, symptoms as a distraction from emotional experience. And I think that there certainly is a role that that plays. But mm-hmm. I've also found that there's this uh, dual function. And, and maybe Sarno did talk about this some by the time he got to the divided mind. But I find that symptoms are even more a communication than they are a distraction. I, I, I think they're both but I think they're more of a communication. I'm just curious what you think about that. I think that the people that I, we work with, um, don't know how to listen to them as a communication because they're so scared. Sure. And in a way, the process of healing is about being able to understand what they what the symptoms are communicating to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and near the near the end of a healing process in in treatment, um, often my clients will say, "Oh, you know, my that familiar pain in my ankle. You know, I noticed that it kicked in and." I ask myself, okay, what if, what's going on with me? What's it trying to tell me? What, what do I need to pay attention to? Right. Yep. So that's how I think of uh, optimal communication, the symptom being an uh, pain in particular being a communication. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like we, we agree this is another area where it's just we have different ways of talking about it. But in a lot of ways, we're saying the same thing. And I think I have found that I, I found this for myself personally, but I found it in working with people also that to me, there's actually been no, no more important communication between me and myself than what my body was saying. I got much more information from my body than any other communication. Does that resonate with you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, I think it's, it's a part of the work that's so rewarding and I'm curious what you think about this because so I do these short-term consultations that are designed to help people understand. I do what's called a mind body map or what I call a mind body map Mm -hmm. with these columns to kind of get a sense of how they can see what's happening. But this also has changed my therapy practice, you know, because I still work with some long-term patients and I find that it, it has radically changed I don't even. I don't know that they would say it's so radical, but it feels radical to me uh-huh. in the way that I am with them because I feel like the body opens up pathways to change much faster than other things. I wonder if you could comment on that, whether you agree with it or not, or what, what your thinking is about that. Um, if I'm understanding you accurately, then I would say that, and I've learned this from Stephen Porges uh, and the, this polyvagal theory and what, what that he has found are the necessary conditions for healing is that we have to feel safe. The body has to feel safe in order for healing to occur. Mm-hmm. And feeling safe may require that the person believe and trust what the physician has told them. And I think that's why so many people can be healed by reading a book or someone else's experience. If it resonates with their experience of themselves, if they feel seen and heard and soothed by what the doctor is writing or a coach is writing about how they've recovered. If they feel, ah, now I know what's wrong, then they feel safe and the healing can begin. Yeah, absolutely. You will get, you'll get no argument from me because this, this podcast is called Crushing Doubt. It is all about, I mean, it has a double meaning because you have the, the, the times where you're feeling crushed by the doubt and then, and then right. you're able to crush it, meaning come to certainty. And I really agree with you. I think that's the thing that leads to safety. But we feel that safety or not in our bodies. 
Right. And as and, Steve Porges says, you can't fool the body. Right. Right. No, Our the body. Cecil Van der Kolk says the body keeps the score. That's right. I have found that, uh, and you know, often we think about the mind-body connection as the flow from the mind to the body, but I actually think the flow goes the other way too. It does. Mm -hmm. Our our bodies are our minds. You know, it just they're inseparable. Yeah, and and the information we can get from them is is fantastic. And you are a great example of that. So I wanna I wanna thank you for coming on. <clears throat> I I hope I can have you back on at some point if you're willing to do that, because I I want to keep talking about these ideas and highlighting some really great people in the field. But you clearly do great work with people i don't i don't even have to hear thank, thank much you. i'd be I, happy to come back i i would love that but um <clears throat> service with the podcast reaching so many people well and that's part of the goal i think we all have the goal in some way of helping pe more and more people see this because the more people that do the more readily available it is when i was suffering from pain I didn't discover Sarno for eight years. Didn't even know about him. Nobody mentioned him. I, I, so mm -hmm. th this is my this is my form of revenge, I guess. <laughs> there but, you go. But it's it's it really is more <clears throat> an act of love for the sufferers out there. I I want I want more people to know this, and it's also just necessary. So I'm glad to know you're out there with me on this. And thanks for coming on, Fran. I'm so glad to have had Fran on. Uh, as I said to her, it, it wouldn't feel complete uh, to, not that you ever complete a podcast because it rolls on and on, but I felt that she really needed to be part of this. She's such a big part of the the mind-body world, having trained with Sarno, trained with Arlene Feinblatt, written a book with Eric Sherman. But one thing that I thought was really fascinating here and important is how we're all saying the same thing in different ways. And I think that sometimes that can be frustrating for people who are suffering and trying to get the answers. But there's a way in which it could also bring you great comfort. Because when you find one of us that speaks to you, you can almost settle into going with them because they're they're the ones who are saying it in the way that works for you. Now, I will say, I, I think that some of the things I talk about are quite different than the other people even though they're saying some similar things, the power column idea that Fran and I touched on here, I think that because I phrase it in a particular way, it allows access a little bit faster potentially, but I, 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 I don't want to presume in terms of what happens for other people in their work. But I would just like to kind of put in a plug for the fact that most of these good mind-body people out there are saying very similar things, and you can trust or take the good parts of what they're saying and get your own system. I've been talking about that for a while. I had a, you know, an episode recently where I talked about developing your system under the uh, kind of rules of thumb that I give and the system that I give. So there's so many ways to get better. This idea of somatic experiencing and seeing what is in your body and the power of the body, the wisdom of the body, certainly came out in this interview with Fran, and I look forward to having her on again to talk more about it all. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and I'll get back to you personally.